So please have a look at this paper. This is a remarkable paper in which, in particular, he has an um, analysis on his own life, his own mathematical life, and the way he behaved as a young mathematician. He has a strong criticism against himself. Uh, his life had several different periods. And the first period, let's say from 1970 to 1975, he was very young and he was very gifted and very talented and very arrogant. And what happened is that during five or six years, he was solving all problems with a, some kind of a naive, he was so naive, he was solving everything without thinking. And um, he was like a dominant lion, eating all the food <laughs> and just leaving the bones for the others. <laughs> <coughs> and what happened is that he made remarkable progress in the understanding of groups of diffeomorphisms, and uh, he was quickly alone because nobody would like to work with him because he was doing everything himself. And somehow, as he said in his papers, I killed the field. And then he, in this paper, he discusses the second part of his life, let's say hyperbolic geometry, where uh, he tried to work in a more collaborative way. <coughs> and he says that for him, mathematics is something that should be shared. And he did share a lot with students, with groups, with uh, many people. And uh, so the first part of his life, our groups of diffeomorphism has been essentially forgotten, and I want to share it with you. Most of the problems are still open, they are remarkably interesting, and uh, nobody has looked at them in the last 40 years. So uh, I think this meeting here is really a collaborative meeting, and with all these young people, it's a good opportunity to build a, a, a new way of working together, forgetting about competition, forgetting about proving something first, working together. I think this is a wonderful occasion here. So, okay, that was my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to uh, <coughs> stay, I want to state one question, one basic question, which is still, still uh, uh, completely open and that I believe could, could be uh, studied. In the very beginning of differential topology, the founding fathers of topology were uh, completely afraid or astonished by the amazing variety of manifolds. There were too many manifolds. No hope of classifying them. For surfaces, we had a complete classification. And quickly, people understood that for three manifolds, there was no hope. And for four manifold, even logic would make it impossible to get a classification. So they had a very uh, good idea to ask simpler questions. And one of the simplest questions that they asked was, what about cobordism? Now, what is cobordism? You have two manifolds, M1 and M2, of the same dimension N, let's say closed manifolds, oriented, and you say that they are cobordant if there is an n plus 1 manifold with boundary whose boundary consists of m1 and m2. So you want, this is an equivalence relation among manifolds, and you would like at first to try to understand these equivalence classes. And using just this joint union, you can make an abelian group out of, out of that, this is the group, the abelian group, of cobordism classes of n manifolds. For example, dimension 1 is not interesting because the circle is the boundary of a disk. And the circle is the only one manifold. Dimension 2 is not interesting either because the, all surfaces are the boundary of 
a solid torus. So everything is a boundary. Dimension three, same thing. Every three manifold, that's a difficult theorem. Any three manifold is the boundary of four manifold. So nothing interesting. Omega one, omega two, omega three is equal to zero. And then Renetton proved in the early 50s that omega four is z. This is one four manifold, which is a complex projective plane, which is a generator of cobordism in dimension four. And then they went again, and then they discovered that omega i is equal to, is a finite group if if i is not divisible by four. And when omega four i is a completely <coughs> well understood this rack as an abelian group is growing like exponential of root of i. So this is completely understood. They ask a modest question, understanding manifolds up to co-boundary, up to Buddhism, and they answered the question. The answer was about 1950 or something. This is basically the Fields Medal of Renéton. Now, when foliations began, In the 60s and in the 60s, people understood that the foliation is also something very complicated, and they asked a question which is also very modest: Can we understand foliations up to cobordism? And this question is completely open. So let me try to explain what they are doing. Suppose you have, let's say, a three manifold with a co-dimension one foliation, and some other three manifold with some other co-dimension one foliation. Let's say it's infinity, and you say that these two foliations are cobordant if there's a four manifold with a co-dimension one foliation transversal to the boundary and inducing your two foliations on both sides. This is a very reasonable definition of cobordism between foliation. And then you can also define a group, omega-3 foliated cobordism classes of co-dimension one foliations <coughs> on three manifolds. And the main question is, what is this group? Can we understand it? And this question is wide open today. Before I go on, let me mention fundamental theorem of, of Thurston, all theories are to do Thurston, a fundamental theorem of Thurston that you can ask the same question in dimension two. Take a foliation on the torus, could you mention one, dimension one, take another foliation on the torus, is there a three manifold and a co-dimension one foliation co connecting them? This is a very fundamental question. And the difficult theorem of Thurston is, yes, any two co-dimension one foliations on the torus are co-bordered. And this is far from easy, far, far from difficult, far, far from easy. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very difficult, very subtle theorem, which is, uh, uh, uses a lot of analysis. It's a beautiful theorem. So in dimension two, the answer is understood. I mean, two, any two foliations uh, are, are cobordant. Dimension three, we don't know. So I want to explain how Thurston reduced the, this question <coughs> of the nature of cobordism classes in three manifolds to some algebraic question about cohomology or homology of groups. And so I want to define that, explain the theorem of Thurston, and explain what is known and basically what is not known. <coughs> At least we know that this group is highly non-trivial, as I will show you. So what is cohomology of a group? And what can we do with that? If you have a group, typically it is not commutative. 
and we don't understand them. And one easy way of understanding it, partially, in a more modest way, is to make it commutative. So you take the quotient of the group by commutators. And this is the abelianization of the group. This is an abelian group which derives from the group. This is a weak version of the group. If you want to think of this not algebraically, but topologically, you can do the following picture. This is a loop in a space, and this is a surface. And this loop here is the product of commutators. So you can understand that the abelianization is just a simple thing. You take a group and you kill boundaries of surfaces. You make them trivial. <coughs> so starting from this, there is a very natural way of doing the same thing in higher dimension. Let me define what is called the second homology group of G. <coughs> so by definition, an element of this group is a surface. You take a surface, Take its fundamental group, take some homomorphism into your group G, and this is for me a homology class. A homology class in H2, by definition, is a homomorphism from pi 1 of the surface to G. Closed now, surface or? What? Closed, closed, closed orientable surface. And then I have to tell you when two of these classes are the same. Just as before, we said two loops are the same if they bound the surface. Now I will say that two surfaces whose, whose pi ones are mapped to G are the same, maybe not the same genus, are homologous if, well, if there is a three manifold having two boundaries, one being the first surface, the other one being the second surface, and if I have a homomorphism from the pi 1 of the 3 manifold to G, which induces the two homomorphisms I have, the two boundary components. It's a very natural definition. This is homomorphisms from pi 1 surface to G up to boundary. This is very topological, very geometric. <coughs> this is what H2 of a group is. Hmm. Any question? <coughs> Definition is clear. What is the Z? What? The Z. H2G Z. Forget it. Otherwise, you take rational multiples of <laughs> Okay. Now, you are not going to. Okay. Now, let me state a theorem of Gromov. Of, 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 of first. Gromov is good too. <laughs> <laughs> the theorem of Thurston is this. The foliated omega theorem that I told you we don't know what it is, is just the second <coughs> homology of a certain group. Which group? The group that we like different morphisms of the interval 0, 1. Let's say different, better, different morphisms of R with compact support. So, it may look strange, but let me tell you what is the geometrical feature of this, of this theorem. I told you what is H2 of the group. H2 of a group is a homomorphism from pi 1 of a surface to the, that group. It is a set of all the homomorphisms. The set of all homomorphisms. And there is a operation. The operation is disjoint union. <laughs> or connected, or connect, connected sum. Uh, 
Maybe it's better. We need it somewhere. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, <coughs> if you have such a representation from diff, from pi 1 on the surface to diff, you can construct a foliation from that. The suspension that we discussed many times here, you can construct a foliation on the fiber bundle whose fibers are the co dimension 1 foliation of a 3 manifold. Uh, which is obtained by suspending the action that we discussed today. So any such representation gives you a foliation. So the theorem is, so in other words, there's a, there is an obvious map here. From a representation, you get the foliation. This foliation defines a cobaltism <coughs> class. Okay? And the theorem is, this is isomorphism. So, in somehow, the theorem of Thurston means that any foliation can be made cobordant to a suspension of a group of different morphisms. <coughs> so, you start with a very complicated foliation. In a, in a three manifold, you don't know what it is. You make surgery, you cut and glue and things, and then you replace it by something cobordant. And at the end, you make it a group of different morphisms. This is the content of the theorem of Thurston. Of first law. Foliations from the cobordism point of view are just groups of different morphisms. <coughs> it doesn't mean it's easy, but we know groups are not, are not easy, but it means at least foliation, foliation can be reduced to groups of different morphisms. To now the question what is this group? is this group? So, this group is basically unknown, except that <coughs> we know that it is highly non-trivial. By this, I mean the following. There is a homomorphism, I will call it A, from H2 of this of R, compact support, to R, which is onto. So this group is so big, in particular, it is not finite generator. This group is so big that you can map it onto the real numbers. The real numbers as an abstract group is a huge group. It is not finite generated. Far from that. It's not countably generated. It's a huge group. And the question is about the kernel of that. And the open question is, is this an isomorphism? <coughs> and I will define this map. I will show you what this map is. This is usually defined in a complicated way. I will try to explain it to you in a geometrical way. Uh, uh, even though uh, usually people describe these things, the homology, uh, using resolutions and commutative algebra and a lot of blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, Thurston was not like that. Thurston was drawing pictures, was thinking of cohomology or homology as very geometrical objects. He was not uh, trying any kind of formalism. One of the points that he discusses in this uh, paper on proofs and progress in mathematics is the writing of mathematics. So, uh, most of the theorems that he proved, including this one, has not been published, or not in a proper way. Thurston was very bad at writing, he didn't like details, and he was convinced that mathematics was beyond papers. And uh, the same happened in the second period of his life, when he played with hyperbolic geometry, etc., he was um, speaking, he was uh, discussing with students, discussing with colleagues, sharing, but he never wrote. And uh, uh, it's a fundamental question of knowing uh, uh, how to write mathematics. And uh, uh, the papers that Thurston wrote are remarkable from that point of view. 
they are understandable. Okay, so let me define that. Why did I call it A? I call it A, I will, I will give the proper name in the, the proper time. I call it A because it's the area. I will explain to you that in the group of diffeomorphisms, there is something like an area. Not, not a volume, not an n-dimensional volume. Anyway, this is infinite dimensional, so there is no concept of Lebesgue measure or nothing like that. However, I will show you that inside this group, there is a way of measuring the area of surfaces. And this is indeed what we want to do. We have an element here, which by definition is a surface. And we want to measure its area. And I will show you how to do that. <coughs> okay, so uh, uh, when uh, uh, Victor gave his talk, he mentioned to us the importance of distortion of diffeomorphisms. If you have a diffeomorphism, F, diffeomorphism, say, of the circle, for instance, let's say dimension one, what Victor called it uh, distortion was simply the function log f prime. Except that uh, Victor being a Russian, you would use ln, and being French, you use log. <laughs> well, no, being French of my generation, you use log. The young people in France know it, they like the position. Shame on them. So, uh, Log f prime is what? How is the Russian notation? No, no, it's it loves it Polish notation. No, it's Eastern <laughs> European. <laughs> so log f prime is a function on the circle. And the easy observation is that on this vector space, say infinity functions on the circle. <coughs> There is a well-defined concept of area. How do I define that? If you give me two functions, u, 1, <coughs> 2, belonging to, say, infinity of the circle, two periodic functions, then you can construct a curve in the plane <coughs> whose first coordinate is u1 and whose second coordinate is u2. This curve defines an area. Let's call that area of u1, u2. This number. This is the area enclosed by the loop u1, u2 in the plane. OK? Now, a good point of this functional with the <coughs> bilinear skew-symmetric function on this vector space is that if you change parameter, if you write u of you get the same number. Why? Because you just get the same curve. The same curve with a different parametrization. And two curves with the same parametrization, same parametrization enclose the same area. So we are very happy because we have this vector space of functions, we have this concept of area of two curves, <coughs> and we know this is wonderful because it's invariant by conjugacy, by, by the action of diff. Unfortunately, but it might look like a small detail, but it is not a small detail, unfortunately, when you change parameter on a diffeomorphism, the Distortion does not quite change like that. The distortion of f composed with phi <coughs> is log prime, which is log f prime composed with phi, and this I like it because it's very invariant under the area, plus this extra boring term log f phi prime. So what's happening when I compute the area 
of log f composed with phi prime, that f1, and f log f2 composed with phi prime. So using the chain rule that uh, Victor was mentioning the other day, this one, we get the area of log f1 prime composed with phi plus log phi prime log f2 prime composed with phi plus log <coughs> phi prime. This, we like it because it's the area of log f1 prime and log f2 prime. This log f prime, log f prime is zero because it's a skew symmetric form. So this gives zero. And we have two extra terms. One is plus the area of log phi prime <coughs> log f2 prime composed with phi minus a log phi prime log f1 prime composed with phi. So these extra terms are, I don't like them. So how to kill them? Well, in order to kill them in a very easy way, we just compute, instead of a function of three, of two different morphisms, a function of three different morphisms. If I have now three different morphisms, one, two, and three, <coughs> what I will do is this, I will associate to them the area of log f1 prime, log f2 prime, plus the area of log f2 prime, log f3 prime, plus the area of log f3 prime, log f1 prime. So this function of three different morphisms now has the wonderful property that if I change coordinates by, by some phi, the extra terms will cancel two by two. Okay, I have it here one, one, uh, one two, very <coughs> So the good point is that this is a well-defined function of three different morphisms of the circle. And this well area of three different morphisms of the circle is completely well-defined and it's independent on the change of coordinates. If I replace f1, f2, f3 by f1 composed with phi, f2 composed with phi, f3 composed with phi, I get the same number. <coughs> Yes? It is obvious that uh, A is linear. Yes, oh. Yeah. May, may, may I recall you how to compute the area of a curve? <laughs> In order to compute the area of a curve, you integrate u v prime. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> That's a typical example of Thurston. No? Thurston would never have said, let's define the coupling u v is integral of u v prime. You would say, let's look at the area of the curve. But of course, the area of the curve is just this simple integral. The int, the so it's linear. So yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is the first message that people like you should know. There is a concept of area in the group of, of different morphisms. If you give me three different morphisms of the circle, one, two, three, in your mind, you think of a triangle with three vertices, f1, f2, f3, and this formula gives you the area of the triangle. And this works wonderfully well. This attributes an area to any representation from parallel surface to group of different officers, and this is the, what I call the area. Yeah. How do you know that uh, your morphism is injective? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the main point. There are two questions. Maybe this homomorphism is trivial. Okay. You, you should have asked the question, how do you know it is not trivial? <laughs> because this I can answer. But if you, have, if you ask me, how do you know it is injective? I don't know. 
If I knew it, uh, I would be very happy because this group would be isomorphic to R. And since I told you that Thurston proved that this is cobordism in class, I would conclude that two foliations are cobordant if and only if they have the same area. Okay? Okay, now let me. Uh, Sorry, yeah. we're just on the surface. Yes, yeah. okay, that's a good question. <laughs> if you take another representative of uh, this homology class, by definition, they are connected by a three dimensional manifold. Mm -hmm. What you do now is you <coughs> triangulate this three dimensional manifold with a lot of pyramids. So you have a triangulated manifold having two, two boundaries. One is the first surface, the other one is the other surface, and you have to add all the contribution of all fast faces. The inner, the, the other boundary, you have what you want to compute, and inside, they, they, they match two by two. So the sum will be zero. This is a, a combinatorical way of using Stokes formula. Stokes formula tells you that if you use two representatives of the same cobordism class, you get the same area. Okay, now, uh, maybe it's time to give a name here. I call this area because I believe it is area, but the official name is God Beyond Veil. God Beyond Veil. There were two French mathematicians. Let me tell you an interesting story about them. They should not repeat it. Uh, <laughs> uh, they discovered this invariant in a completely different uh, way. And uh, they gave a talk uh, in, uh, in Oberwolfach. Uh, and uh, they explained that they were very happy because they had invented a new invariant, blah, blah. And at the end of the talk, one participant, Roussari, uh, raised his hand and asked essentially your question. He said, how do you know that your invariant is not zero? And it turned out that neither God beyond nor they had even thought of this question. <laughs> <laughs> so they had created a new invariant without even thinking, is it zero or not? And the story is that in the audience, there was Howard Rosenberg, who is now in IMPA. And Howard Rosenberg was coming from California. And uh, when he came back to California, the next day, he <coughs> met the young Thurston, who was a student at the time. He was, I think, undergraduate. And Rosenberg told me that he explained, look, these guys have created uh, a new invariant. They don't even know if it's zero. And uh, Rosenberg told me last week that uh, Thurston knocked at his door one hour later, providing a proof that this homomorphism is onto. So to prove that the homomorphism, that's one of the first, but he, was, he didn't even publish that at the time. So the proof that this is onto is a matter of finding examples. You have to find examples of representations for which the, the area is equal to given number. You are given a number, you have to find a representation for which you have a given number. So I will not show you the exact, the exact example of, of Thurston, but I will uh, explain the rough idea of the, the proof by Thurston that this is on two. In particular, this means that the set of cobordism classes of foliations is uncountable, which was which is a soft reaction. In dimension two, I told you everything is cobordant to everything. In dimension three, you have a continuous set of possibilities. So let me let us try to look. Because you have a homomorphism from pi one of the surface to PSL to R, back to our, our love, huh? 
the PSL to R is the group of diffeomorphisms of the circle. <coughs> Can we compute the area? This is a specific example. Surface groups can be mapped into PSL to R. I told you that any representation to diff have an area, which is a number. What is this number in this specific case? So I, tell, I give you the answer. It's an area. So you take the Poincaré disk, take a base point, take three elements, F1, F2, F3, in PSL to R. What is this, the area of these three elements? Well, you take the image of the three base, the, the base point of three points. You get three points in the Poincaré disk. You connect them as an actual triangle and take the area. By geodesics? By geodesics. So the area I define for any triple of diffeomorphisms in the specific case when these diffeomorphisms are isometry of the Poincaré disk is just the simple-minded area form on the Poincaré disk. So if I take as an example uh, a discrete co-compact subgroup of PSL to R, as we like it, what do we get? We get as this afternoon, the fundamental domain, which is a polygon, and the area of this homomorphism is the area of the polygon, which is the area of the surface. So in the very specific case where pi 1 of the surface maps to a discrete co-compact subgroup of PSL to R, the number that we get is just the area of the surface. Now, bad news, because one idea to modify the number to get it onto, to get different numbers, would be to change the polygon. Why not changing the polygon? You will change the lattice. We have flexibility in rank 1. So we know that the lattice is flexible. So let's do some flex. And let's compute the number, unfortunately or fortunately, etc. Gauss Bonnet is there. And Gauss Bonnet tells us that the area of the surface does not depend, curvature minus one, does not depend on the way that you chose the metric. The Gauss Bonnet formula tells you that this is equal to 2 pi times 1 minus the genus or something. So you can change, nothing changes. Yes? Yeah, one question. I understood that this is the determinant of the surface yes. you consider from yes. the beginning. Yeah. But for that reason, the area is different because if you change the surface, the area characteristic is different. Yes. So yes. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just taking one example of an embedding of the parallel surface as a discrete subgroup as a lattice. If I take another surface, we'll probably be dense or complicated in PSL2. Okay. okay? Yes? Why should we believe that this is the same area formula? That seems like a miracle. Because ah. this is in the hyperbolic plane and not in the R2. And because, uh, I can tell you. you. You can compute. I gave you a formula for the area. So uh, you take two elements of PSL2R and you integrate U V prime. U and V are just log of AX plus B divided six. Do some computation. Use the Cauchy, the Cauchy formula. Yep, you get that. Another answer. Another answer would be, what else could it be? <laughs> no, that's a simple answer. It's a function of three points on the disk, which is invariant under the under Möbius transformation and which is additive under subdivision. It is a constant multiple of the other. Of okay? This is the unique possibility. Okay, so the obvious idea of moving the lattice does not work. Now comes the idea of Thurston. 
uh, he used another group. We know that P is set to R acts on the circle. We know that PSL to R contains rotations. And we know, we have seen that this morning, that PSL to R has fundamental group Z. It's homeomorphic to a circle across the disk. Therefore, there is a finite covering space of PSL to R. For example, I can take PSL to R. which is the two-fold covering space of PSL to R. And I let it act on the circle by lifting the circle to the circle. And the, I will get an action on the circle which is somehow the same as before, except that initially we had hyperbolic points, uh, hyperbolic elements having two fixed points. Now they have four fixed points, because we have lifted to a two-fold cover. Mm -hmm. But in this PSL to twice, we have the two-fold cover of SO2. And the two-fold cover of SO2 is also an SO2. Because when you lift a circle, you get a circle. So the idea of Thurston is this. You will glue two, two lattices, one sitting inside PSL2R, the other one sitting into, 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 sitting into this two-fold cover of PSL2R, along rotations. And then, if you choose correctly, and this is not difficult to do, but you have to have the idea, you can, there is some flexibility for the two pieces that you glue. And if you do some computation, it's not hard, you get that you do have a continuous variation of the god v array. That's the construction of, of uh, can you imagine, an undergraduate student in 1971, who had this idea immediately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the, the, the end of the, of the story, so the, let me just give a summary of the, of the uh, open question. This is one of the open questions in a huge quantity of beautiful open questions in higher dimension, higher dimension, that has been forgotten because of the behavior of this arrogant young man. Mm -hmm. he, he was so good that everybody was getting away from him. So, uh, but uh, let me just, uh, as a, as a so, uh, omega 3 focus, foliated, as you remember, this is the set, or group, a billion group of co classes of co-dimensional informations on three magnitudes. First and proof, this is the same as H2 of this of R with compact support. First and proof that this maps onto R. Nobody knows about the kernel. Let me finish by mentioning uh, some interesting results. I said here class A infinity. I could ask the same question for C3, C4, C2, C1, C0. The same theorem here is true <coughs> in C2. And then this is, and then let me mention two results. One by uh, John Mather. In class C0, the cobordism C0 is 0. Everything is cobordum to 0 in the topological category. <coughs> this is not so hard. But what is much harder is the work of my friend Tsuboy in class C1. He proved the same. I believe many of us can tell me, did he prove it in C1 plus epsilon? Yeah, but not for the top epsilon, I mean, for some epsilon, not okay. for, for one half. Okay, so 
So uh, if I believe Andres, I believe him. Uh, this is also true. For, there is an epsilon for which this is true. And everybody believes that the base <coughs> epsilon is one half. And everybody knows that epsilon bigger than one half, this is not true. So this is, becomes complicated and technical, but this is a, a fascinating topic. So I will stop here, and really I believe that uh, people from dynamical systems have forgotten this kind of question, which are really beautiful. A mixture of geometry, <coughs> dynamics, and groups, and everything we like here. Thank you.